Hello BookTube. I have a tag for you on this tag Monday. It's the how to adapt a book tag. Redux. <laughs> because originally, uh, it's from Seeking Stories. And originally, Kristen and Ryan, when they did their original version of this tag, uh, they went overboard on the Insider Baseball Film Geek details. <laughs> so you know, you know you're in trouble if your tag has 57 questions. And one of them is, who would be your backup dolly operator? <laughs> Nobody outside of film school cares about such things. And they eventually realized that and made a redux, a simplified version for those of us who like movies, but don't necessarily, didn't necessarily go to film school. Uh, and I don't think I was tagged in that original video, and I was certainly not tagged in the Redux, and no one has ever done this has ever tagged me, because everybody hates me, because I smell. But I want to do the tag anyway. And so I'm gonna. <laughs> and, uh, it starts off right away with the simplest question of all, which is, uh, question number one, which book most deserves an adaptation? Now, I don't know about deserves, uh, because I think all books deserve adaptations. So, uh, uh, smart, knowing, maybe quirky. Uh, off-angle adaptation awaits every book, or should, and that would be great. But there is one uh, mega best-selling science fiction fantasy work that has not ever been adapted when everything around it on all sides has been, and that is The Dragon Riders of Pern by Anne McCaffrey, uh, the first book of which is Dragonflight, which started out as a short story called Dragonflight, and it was made into a novel in the late 1960s, and then the sequels followed, Dragon Quest and White Dragon, and then dozens more books after that. Uh, the book to, immediately after White Dragon was a standalone novel called Morata, Dragon Lady of Pern, that I thought was very, very good. I don't think I have a copy, but, uh, but I really liked it. And then they've just gone on from there. The series just went on and on from there. It bought Anne McCaffrey an island, literally an island of her own. Uh, and... Some of them were good, and some of them were better than others, and some of them were pure fan service. There was also a young, a young adult series uh, uh, set in the world. In, in the world of Pern, there are all sorts of levels of a quasi-feudalistic society, and one of the important people in that society are Harpers, the tell tales from from weir to weir, from hall to hall. And uh, there's a young adult series that that came out around the same time as these original trilogy that tells stories set in that, in that world of the Harpers of Pern. <clears throat> uh, and the, the story is terrific. Absolutely terrific. Absolutely uh, elemental. If Anne McCaffrey had chosen to narrate the story from its very beginning, it would have started out as straight up science fiction because Pern was settled by human colonists from Earth in spaceships <laughs> with high technology who decided to settle the world and gradually over the course of time and through tragedy uh, lost knowledge of and use of all of that higher equipment because of an, uh, a little known detail that the original scans of the planet Pern which rendered it which r rendered it perfectly habitable for humans missed those original scans missed something a potentially deadly detail that they shouldn't have missed. But let me let me read you uh, the beginning of that Anne McCaffrey gives us because it's terrific. Rookbat in the Sagittarian sector was a golden G-type star. It had five planets, two asteroid belts, and a stray planet that it had attracted and held in recent millennia. When men first settled on Rookbat's third world and called it Pern, they had taken little notice of the strange planet swinging around its adopted primary in a wildly erratic elliptical orbit. For two generations, the colonists gave the bright red star little thought, until the path of the wanderer brought it close to its stepsister in perihelion. When such aspects were harmonious and not distorted by conjunctions with other planets in the system, the indigenous life form of the wandering world sought to bridge the space gap between its home and the more temperate and hospitable planet. At these times, silver threads dropped through Pern skies, destroying anything they touched. The initial losses the colonists suffered were staggering. As a result, during the subsequent struggle to survive and combat the menace, Pern's tenuous contact with the mother planet was broken. Uh, those original scientists had noticed that one of the indigenous life forms of Pern was a tiny reptile-like creature. Uh, little dragonettes, about that long. And one of the amazing things those scientists learned about those dragonettes is that they had the ability to go between in italics, to shift themselves, to teleport from one place to another. Uh, the, I have not memorized, I have not 
totally read all of the later Purr novels. I did read a lot of them, but I haven't lodged any of the details in my memory. I'm not sure. There are original. There are novels about that original, where Anne McCathery went back to that original colonist story, and the original bioengineering of those little dragonettes and the study of their ability to teleport from one place to another. Uh, as to whether or not the dragonettes develop that ability specifically to avoid threadfall, probably, probably they did. But one way or another, those original scientists realized that if they could engineer those little dragonettes to be enormous and retain that ability, then those dragons could have riders. They could have dragon riders. They could maybe survive the passage from one spot to another with the dragons. And the dragons have another, the full-grown dragons have another uh, very interesting biological adaptation, which is that if they are fed rocks of a certain chemical, their internal processes can allow them to belch flame. <laughs> they become fire-breathing dragons. Uh, but all scientifically. There's no mythology, and there's no folklore, there's no fantasy element anywhere in the Dragon Riders of Pern. A lot of people who just see the gorgeous covers can't really make that out on this this omnibus edition because uh, it's just details. But the original cover for, for this Dragonflight reissue, the original mass market cover of Dragonflight was hideous. Absolutely hideous. But the second one, the one, this Michael Weir cover was amazing. Uh, Michael Whelan. The front and the back, the whole thing makes a painting on its own that is just gorgeous. If I had a poster of that original cover in the full width of the thing, I would have it matted and framed in a second. Um, but uh, that's the gist of the story, is that by the time these Earth scientists have bioengineered those little dragonettes into full-blown dragons of different ranks, there's brown and blue and bronze and the females who are gold, uh, by the time they did that, and by the time they stripped all the technology out of their original craft and all of their settle modules, the knowledge of how to use these things was slowly drifting out of their society, as their society became much more concerned with simple survival. Now, I, just like I don't remember the, the precise details of why those Dragonettes originally had that ability, I also don't remember if there's a later Pern book in which the obvious question is dealt with here that that the question that's raised in that original uh introduction which is why was there no second why was there no follow-up expedition to find out why pern went silent maybe that is handled in another book or maybe it will be handled in a future book uh because this author's daughter i think is set to restart this whole series uh but one way or another uh uh you can tell from that original paragraph the seeds of a story here, which is that a long time passes. And you remember the, that original, that opening paragraph mentions that the wandering planet, the red star's orbit, is extremely irregular. It's, it's extremely elliptical, and Thread won't try to make the, the gap between planets. They won't try to bridge that gap unless the conditions are just right. So it's not just a question of perihelion. It also has to be that the other planets in the Rookbat system are also in line to behave. So it's not... A regular thing, it's not a planned thing, it's not a frequent thing, and the inevitable happens. The colonists on Pern lose sight of the precautions they need to take. Having no... Uh, thread kills biological matter. It doesn't affect rock. So the holds, the strongholds, the, the civilization centers, the weirs on mountaintops and extinct volcanoes must not have any kind of greenery encroaching on them. That shows lax in discipline. And the dragon riders, who become an elite cast of warriors who only exist to fly and combat thread. The dragon's flames can burn thread in midair. The dragons can go between. They can teleport to keep their dragon riders out of harm and themselves out of harm's way. So that thread can be fought in the air before it gets to the ground. And there are ground crews that can fight any that get past the dragons. Uh, but those dragon riders obviously can't do anything else. Right? They've got to train and be alert. So they tithe the human villages, the villages all around them. They tithe them for their upkeep. And all of that starts to fall into disarray. It starts to become forgotten over time. A long time, a long interval happens. And that is when Dragonflight starts. When the one weir, that is, that is the name for dragon, dragon rider compounds that are up on mountains and that host these, these enormous dragons. 
And there used to be quite a few of them. There used to be several of them. And now there's only one left. And it's one queen is uh, is ready to die. And her rider, is her, her the human who bonds with her, is ready to die. And they need a new one. They're on a quest. The dragon riders are on a quest for a new queen. Uh, because the dragons bond telepathically with their riders. And and it forms an elite society of these people who who are when we meet them in Dragonflight they are on rough times not every landhold the landholders have become arrogant and lax and they don't like the fact that they're having to pay not only tribute to keep the dragon riders but also bulls bullocks from their from their herds to feed the dragons the dragons just swoop down on livestock and eat it bolt it whole with liberal amounts of gore because these things these animals are enormous uh, that is when Dragonflight starts, is when it's a perfect setup for a story, because not only are our heroes growing despised by the people that they were sworn to protect, but also you just know that the worst is going to happen, that this interval is going to end, that the red star is going to rise in the morning, and suddenly threat is going to fall again when the planet is, the human habitations in the planet are not ready. And there's only one weir of Dragonflight. There's only one weir of dragon riders to, to protect all of human civilization. You know, in other words, it's going to be a classic science fiction story where uh, the old ways have to be revived and where a last-ditch band of heroes has to fight an, a threat that everyone thought was gone. So it it right there you see it has elemental Hollywood components to it. It, it would make a fantastic movie, is what I'm trying to say. So that's my answer to question number one, is Dragon Riders of Pern, specifically Dragonflight, the first book in Dragon Riders of Pern. Uh, question number two is, which medium best suits this book? Movie, TV, theater, etc.? And for me, uh, one 90-minute movie, okay? <laughs> one 90-minute movie. Not three movies, not six movies, not five seasons on HBO. One 90-minute movie that is under the tight control of a cast, a director of photography, a director, a producer. One 90-minute movie. Okay? <laughs> uh, question number three is, what are you most excited about, about this hypothetical adaptation? And for me, the thing I'm most excited about is the thing that originally wowed me when I read Dragonflight. I missed the short story. I only read the novel when it when it came out when it, when it came out and expanded into a novel and I was blown away but I love the novel I think it's really good we'll get into some of its potential problems in a minute but uh, the thing that blew me away was the set piece that set piece of enormous dragons wheeling and flying in their in their ranks in air flaming thread vanishing and reappearing their leather clad riders uh, directing their actions and staying in mental contact and vocal contact with each other, valiantly risking their lives to protect the planet and the people on the ground, on top of these mythical-seeming creatures who are not beasts of burden. They are, they are fellow warriors. The, the dragons are not uh, animals in the sense of servants of their dragon riders. They're in mental contact. They're, they're in equal telepathic bonds. That, that set piece idea that set piece picture of launches of these enormous dragons taking off from their mountain crags to fight deadly threat in the air huh. that's what i would be most excited to see uh uh question number four which actors should portray the characters here we're going to have a bit of a problem uh, certainly i would run into problems with hollywood's casting decisions because hollywood's casting decisions largely stink they they pick uh they don't mostly care, no matter what directors tell you, they don't mostly care about who does what in an audition. They mostly want who made money for their last movie, which ends you up with ridiculous choices being made or being brooded about whether they're taken or not. Imagine how much worse we would all be in our imaginative lives if the movie studio's original suggestion for Gandalf in the Peter Jackson movies, Sean Connery, had been acted on. Imagine how horrible that would have been. And the only reason it was thrown around is because he's known. I, I dread, absolutely dread, that kind of thinking on the part of Hollywood. Where, where, and don't get me started on the original idea for the casting of Aragon. Oh my God. But the, the, 
that kind of thinking drives me crazy. It, it makes me walk in terror of what's going to happen next. Specifically, I call it the Chris Pratt terror. Because you just know that if Hollywood were casting around for a Lord of the Rings remake now, and I know a lot of you kids are going to go nuts at the very idea that Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings could be remade, but you will live to see it. Get used to it. There will be a second Lord of the Rings, a, a redo of the Lord of the Rings trilogy with a new director, a multi-ethnic and multi-sexual orientation cast, and Chris Pratt as Gandalf. <laughs> you just get, you get yourself ready to see it because that's the way Hollywood thinks. And I don't like that at all. I'm of the opinion that, that, uh, you should favor a fresh slate as often as possible. And you might say, well, there's a lot riding on this, right? I mean, any movie adaptation of Dragonflight would cost $200 million, at least. And there are a lot of fans of the book, but there are a lot of people who have grown away. I mean, Dragonflight came out 60 years ago. So, uh, so you say, there are people who would say, there's a lot riding on this. We can't have it just on a bunch of unknowns who might be terrible in front of a camera. And to that I say, don't look to unknowns, then look to, look to Broadway. Look to stage actors who've been dealing for a long time, most of them since they were 11 or 12, with far greater pressures and far greater demands on their professionalism than any Hollywood actor, even the most seasoned one. Go to, Hol go to Broadway for your choices. And for that, I have uh, three choices here. The, there are three main characters who are human in Dragonflight. There's Lessa, who... Uh, who whose family originally ran one of those keeps and were dispossessed. She remains alive. She is a bitterly decide, bitterly wants her land holding back. But it turns out in the course of Dragonflight that she is the object of the Dragon Rider's quest. She is the one who can maybe bond with a new queen and become uh, the new first lady of the Dragon Rider Weirs. What the Dragon Riders on search don't know is that there's something even more special about Lessa. She can talk to all dragons. Not just the one that she bonds with when its egg breaks right in front of her, but all of them. Including the dragons of the dragon riders who come on search. And the two main dragon riders, the leader of the search is a man named Flar, F apostrophe L-A-R, who is uh, older than Len Lessa, uh, but not much older. I am always in favor of casting young. Cast young. Cast young. Don't give me a... a five cigar a day tobacco addict who in his, who's in his late 20s to play Simon in Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. Don't give me somebody, a, a, a leathery faced, bourbon swilling tobacco addict who's almost 30 to play Peter Parker in high school. Don't do that. Cast young. And, and so I would cast, even though Flar is older than Lessa, I would still say cast him young. And then the third human character is Fenor, F apostrophe N-O-R, Flar's brother, who is one of his lieutenants, and is a very welcome, lighter tone. Flower can be a bit on the somber side, and Fnor intentionally counterbalances that element in his brother by being a little bit more accessible. He could be humor in a movie that badly needs it, doesn't have it any other way. Uh, and for those, I do have casting, but I don't have... This is where I suffer from not being able to put pictures up here. You're just going to have to Google these people and take my word for it. Uh, for Flower, I would cast Kyle Dean Massey. Because he's, he's slightly, has a slightly sterner, older look to him. He could, I think he could carry the part. Uh, for Fnor, I would cast Joshua Castile. C-A-S-T-I-L-L-E. So it could be Castille. Uh, as, as, I think he bears enough of a physical resemblance uh, so that they could pass as brothers. And I think he would do, good, do a good job with the, with the lighter aspect. And then for the star of the show, Lessa is the star of Dragonflight. I would cast Shahadi Wright Joseph. Uh, who I... I don't know that you're going to know any of these people. <laughs> and, uh, but, but she is absolutely electric on stage and, and on, in front of the camera. Absolutely electric. And she is younger. She, is, she could play young. She could play a young Lessa. When we meet Lessa, uh, she's a slop girl. She, she's, treated, she's a servant, a lowly servant at the hold where where the ma one the master of the hold is contemptuous of dragon riders and doesn't care anything for her at all. It takes a while for for Flar and Fnor and the other dragon riders to realize what Lessa is. Uh, that she's a true diamond in the rough. So I would choose those and then there are other characters. There's a master harper. Uh, there's there are other dragon riders. 
But the other main characters in this story are the dragons. There's Nemeth, the gigantic bronze dragon that is bonded to Flar. Uh, there's Ramoth, the queen, who will bond with Lessa. And there are a bunch of other dragons, but they would very much be characters in this movie, but they aren't humans, so I don't, I don't have anybody to cast them for. Uh, then question number five is, who should direct the adaptation? Uh, and in parentheses, uh, Ryan and Kristen say, if you aren't familiar with many directors, Spielberg is never a bad answer. I say just the opposite. Spielberg is a very bad answer <laughs> to this and any other adaptation. Now, I don't want to hit this too hard. <laughs> this is a friendly tag, whether I was tagged or not, whether people don't like my smell or not. I don't want to hit this too hard. Ryan, who, I, who, uh, who does the Redux tag on his channel, is a kind young man, he's a God-fearing young man, and I don't want to drive him to a homicidal rage. So my answer to the question, who would direct the adaptation, uh, is very brief. It's only three words, and I'll try and keep it nice and quick. We'll move right on to the next question so that I don't make him reach through the camera and try to throttle me. And my answer is simple. Directors don't matter. And now let's move straight on. <laughs> While he's having an apoplectic fit, let's move straight on to question number six. Which scene or scenes are you most excited about seeing in this adaptation? And that, it's the scene that I mentioned. It's a climactic scene in which a sky full of dragons fight a sky full of thread. I can picture it in my mind. The sky itself would be cloudy. It would be a dark, cloudy day. And the thread would, as it spins and falls to the ground, it would sparkle. Every time it curves in such a way as to catch the weak light, it would shine and shimmer. So it would actually be, paradoxically, a kind of pretty thing to look at. Even though it's absolutely deadly, can burn through flesh, can burn through vegetation, can destroy a whole field of crops. Even, even so, coming down in the sky, it looks winkling like that. It looks kind of pretty. And then you have the massive launching of the dragons in great wings. These enormous beasts unfurling their wings with their human riders on board. And then the swooping and swirling in unison, in perfect unison, burning and flashing. I picture a scene, Cinematisse won't like that it's the first thing that comes to my mind. Probably we should get Jason from Old Lou's chapter and verse out of the room so that he doesn't have an apoplectic fit too. But the scene I have in mind is the climactic fight scene in Avengers Age of Ultron, where uh, the, the director of photography very intentionally wants to imitate a Tiepolo fresco where the, you're watching the action happen from all angles and all sides, and it, there's no cutaways, and it's all, there's this one set piece motion thing that is just incredible. I don't have the film school vocabulary to describe it, but what I wouldn't give to see that in Dragon Rise of Pern. Oh my, what I wouldn't give. Um, and then uh, question number seven is, what are you most nervous about in this potential adaptation? And with Dragonflight, there are two things. And one is, uh, is falls on the heading of a spoiler, so I don't want to give it away. But the climax of the book involves Anne McCaffrey upping the ante on everything that's going on. And you don't see it coming. You don't expect it at all. It makes perfect sense in the context of the story. But it is, it is the dramatic linchpin that makes the ending of the book possible. Uh, I don't want to give it away, but I'm worried. I worry about that just because... I think that it would be one of those dramatic turns that would require a large amount of exposition dumping that would kill the, the momentum of the movie. This movie should have a ton of momentum. The red star is rising in the morning. It is not little anymore. It's big. It's very close. Disaster is impending on this world that has fallen asleep to the urgency of the, of the problem. And there's only a tiny handful of people who have been trained and equipped to deal with that disaster. This movie should be tense right from the beginning, and that tension should just be growing until Threadfall. And uh, I worry that that momentum would be damaged by the intrusion of this thing. In fact, I worry that a director, because they mostly do damage, uh, would look at what happens in Dragonflight. They, of course, wouldn't read it because there's coke to snort. But they'd have it told to them, and they would say, that twist has to go. <laughs> And I wouldn't want that at all. I would want to keep the twist. I just want to handle it well. But no, the main thing that I worry about uh, is the dynamic between Flar and Lessa. This is this has sparked a great deal of commentary uh, about Dragon, the whole Dragon Rider, the, the the original trilogy. 
uh, it sparked that commentary even in the 20th century. In the 21st century, I'm surprised that blue checkmark Puritans on Twitter haven't dug up Anne McCaffrey and decapitated her. I'm surprised they haven't done that because it's a minor thing and they don't care about it and it's set in an in a intellectual property that they've never noticed and don't, and don't give two figs about. And that's just the sort of thing they like to brigade uh, because they don't have anything in their lives that they actually do care about except wielding the power to cancel people, to destroy things. Uh, but we, let's leave that aside for the moment and talk about this dynamic because Flar shakes Lessa quite a bit. It's Anne McCaffrey was drawing on the old school bodice ripping romance stereotypes of the romance novels of the 60s in which and the Regency novels of of the 60s and 70s where the main character is old, the main character's a man. He is noticeably older than the female character. He's noticeably parental there's a love interest there obviously but there's also a parental thing it's a very 1950s way of oh you minx are you spending my money uh, you know be the meal better be on the table when i get home that sort of thing where in pop culture in the 1950s and mccaffrey soaked that up and delivered it in this book in the pop culture of the 1950s the man of the house is also the father of everyone in the house including his wife and just treats her that way what have you got into now, you wacky thing, you little minx? And unfortunately, that is part of the relationship between Flar and Lessa in Dragonflight. That is that is part of their initial relationship where he has to clean her up because she's filthy. She's a, a, a slop maiden. And he not only has to clean her up, he has to introduce her to the world of dragons. And it allows him, it allows McCaffrey to give him a very paternal and very hands-on a very handsy attitude towards her where at one point in in the climax of the book Les actually tells someone that she's afraid flower will shake her it wouldn't pass muster now there's no way that you could make that acceptable now you could make it if you made a movie version you could make their relationship rough but you couldn't make it that you couldn't you couldn't do an explicit adaptation of that and i worry that that's part of that that being in the book is part of the reason why this has never been seriously approached for adaptation i'm told I was told years ago by a friend of mine who lives and works in Hollywood that, that there is a Dragon Rider idea that has been in so-called adaptation development hell forever. Just forever. For longer than a lot of the people involved have been alive. Uh, I don't doubt that. And I wonder if this isn't one of the reasons. Because people maybe read the book and thought, well, we can't do that. I've never thought that it was that much of a problem. Certainly the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever, have much more problems with that, with things like that than anything in Dragon Riders, especially since it's counterbalanced by the fact that Lessa has more power than anyone. She has more power than any of the Dragon Riders. Flar can only bespeak Nemeth. He can only bespeak his own dragon. Lessa can talk to all dragons. And that that gives... She has far more agency, far more power, far more importance in the story than any male character. And I've, I always thought, even in the beginning when I read this thing, I thought, well... Okay, that that's a little bit romancy. It's a little bit bodice ripper that that he's you know calling her little and and child and whatnot, but it it doesn't ruin the book because there's a huge counterbalance to it that isn't present in a lot of the romance templates that it's aping. So that'd be the thing that I'd worry about. I don't think it would be hard to fix. It wouldn't be hard to fix at all. It, we we have this in Hollywood movies today where where there's rough wooing where the man and the woman, the lead man and the lead woman, are rough with each other. It wouldn't have to be physically. You could maintain almost all of it without doing it any violence. But that's the thing that I would worry about, is that some uh, woke Twitter scold would get in the ear of whoever's directing this thing and want, I don't know, I don't know, Lessa to deck Flar to, to punch him and knock him straight down on his ass, maybe when they first meet or something dumb like that. That would that would ruin the whole the whole original dramatic chemistry of the book. I'd worry about that, but that would that would be uh, that'd be where it would be. Uh, then question number eight is, let's get real. Do you think this book has a shot at ever being adapted? Well, I do. I do. I would... I, the, the fact that it is in development hell, according to a person who I guess would know, is a good thing for me. The fact that the, that the, the novels are being relaunched with, with a, a young female author, youngish female author, is a good thing. I... I don't know if this particular book would get adapted. I think it's great. Its bones are fantastic for a movie. Uh, but 
the fact that it's in development at all means that somebody somewhere hasn't forgotten about it. I don't know. I don't know one way or another. I'm maintaining most of my worry for what Amazon is going to do with Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave a little bit of worry aside for Dragonflight somewhere down the line. <laughs> uh, and then question number nine. Uh, on that note, do you think there's a chance it would be a good adaptation? I would love it. I would love it if it were good. I, if you concentrate on the basics of what Anne McCaffrey provides you in Dragonflight, an insuperable problem, a problem that that everyone who is going to be affected by it has ignored. We see you see that pattern in Hollywood movies all the time, and a small band of people whose job it is to protect those people who don't know it and don't care and don't appreciate it. That is a great bones of a story, and the the plot twist that I mentioned that I, I don't want to spoil is incredible. It's an incredible plot twist. It would it would make for an incredibly rousing final act of a movie. Uh, so, you know, if it were done well, I, then I would love it. Of course, it could be done very poorly. But but uh, but anyway, that is the How to Adapt a Book Tag, Redux. I'm sorry that I went on at such length. And uh, no one tagged me because you all apparently have issues with my personal hygiene or lack thereof. But I want to tag any of you who have an idea for this because this is a great tag. Let's get talk. You all know where I stand on the subject of... of uh, adaptations of literary works. <laughs> and a lot of you disagree with me. I say the adaptation is almost always better than the original. In the case of high fantasy or high science fiction, canonical science fiction and fantasy, there's a telltale counter example, which is Earthsea. Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea books was, was adapted by the Sci-Fi Channel in an adaptation that is in everybody's list in the ranks of the worst production ever of anything, not just a science fiction adaptation. But nevertheless, most of them are. For instance, uh, I think it was BBC did a fantastic adaptation of Ursula Le Guin's The, the Lathe of Heaven. Uh, the first adaptation, not the second one. The, the one from decades and decades ago. It's, it's fantastic. It's still watchable today. So I would hope, <laughs> I would hope that it was good. And I think a lot of you probably have ideas like this yourself. I'd love to hear them. What, what thing is out there that you would love to see adapted? The only piece of, uh, the only request I would make of you having watched a few of these tags is that when it comes to who should direct, please don't say Peter Jackson, <laughs> okay? I know you liked his Lord of the Rings trilogy. So did I. Don't say Peter Jackson. If you don't know a director, then don't name a director. But don't say him. Let's not all say Peter Jackson, okay? But anyway, anyway. Uh, I'm gonna, and also, no, no, no more instructions. Uh, I'm going to leave this open-ended. Anybody who's watching this who has always had an idea for an adaptation of a favorite book of theirs, go to. Extra points for nonfiction November if you can think of a great nonfiction book that can be adapted. Lord knows Hollywood looks at a lot of those. Uh, but anyway, uh, that is the How to Adapt a Book Tag Redux. I'm going to wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.